Jessica. And I'm Josh. Welcome to The Branch. We're so glad that you're here. And as always, we would love to know that you are here. So go to The Branch app and hit check in. Parents, do you need a night out? Yes, is the answer to that question. We have a parents night out coming up October 8th. This is where you can drop your kids off from 5 to 8 p.m. at our Vista Ridge campus and we will take care of them. We'll have some pizza. We'll watch a movie so that you can enjoy a kid free night. If you would like to sign up for that, it's $15 per family and you can register for that on the Branch app. Also coming up, parents, if you have a high schooler, you're going to want to register them for the Branch Youth Late Night coming up on October 15th. They're going to meet at Vista Ridge at 8 o'clock and they're going to hang out, do a scavenger hunt and some challenges. I've been hearing some of the ideas that Marley wants to do for that event and it sounds awesome. You're definitely going to want your high schooler to be there. It's going to be really fun. And we'll have another one for the middle schoolers coming up at the end of October. And if your student isn't yet plugged into Branch Youth, these are great ways to make a first step into getting your student involved in what what we're doing in the youth ministry. So go to the app and register for those today. And coming up at the end of October, October 30th, we have got Trunk or Treat at both of our campuses. We are going to be hosting our neighborhoods at both campuses and we need your help. Specifically, we need you to sign up to decorate your vehicle and host our trick-or-treaters by passing out candy as they come through. We also need help with food, traffic, and the most important thing, cleanup. You can sign up for that on the Branch app, but there's one more thing we want you to do, and everybody can do this one. Invite your neighbors to this event. You can invite the neighbor across the street or post on social media. This is a great way to connect people with the branch. Also, we're continuing our series on hearing the voice of God. There have been so many stories of God speaking to the people at the branch, and we're so excited to hear how that continues. Again, we're so glad that you're here and welcome to the branch.
that line back up one slide. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. I don't know how many times you've sing this, sung this song. I've sung it a hundred times. I've never noticed how weird that line is. How strange it is to say that just by the name of Jesus, we could be awestruck with wonder. And yet, in eternity, every day is going to be that feeling of just witnessing the glory of God. We get glimpses of it here. We've had glimpses. And when we, we gather, we're asking for a revelation for His glory. You know, the, the definition of glory isn't necessarily just giving someone credit. It's them being revealed, their greatness being revealed. So when we give someone glory, we're, we're acknowledging the greatness that they are. We're realizing it. We're realizing the greatness of God when he gives us revelations of who he is, when he gives us glimpses of that wonder. So as we join in with all creation this morning, on a Sunday morning, there's countless believers singing with us and with all the angels and all the realms of heaven, lifting high the name of Jesus. God, overwhelm us with your wonder. Help us to be awestruck at the mere mention of the name of Jesus and the power and the glory that's in that name. Uh, in this series on hearing God, that one of the things I've loved the most about this series is all the stories I have been receiving from so many of you and even people who've been following along online around the country regarding their own experience with the voice of God in their life. I wish I had time to share with you all the stories. I, 
I don't. And some of them are very powerful. Others are quite funny. And then every now and then, uh, somebody will send me a story that, well, I'll just let this speak for itself. Uh, Judy Clark wrote this to me just a little while ago. She says, I retired from teaching a year ago, but I still substitute. A few days ago, I was talking to another teacher about someone who we didn't particularly care for in our school. And I said, he's a jerk. And right after I said that, I heard a voice. That's not nice. It was Siri on my phone, which was in my purse on my shoulder. I hadn't touched my phone, nor had I said Siri's name. And let me tell you, we were both convicted and immediately repented as believers right there in the teacher's lounge. I love that. You know, there are all kinds of voices around us all the time. And in that case, what Siri had to say probably wasn't all that far off the mark for a disciple of Jesus. But any series that's going to reflect on hearing and discerning the voice of God has to allow for at least a message where we talk about and account for the possibility of hearing other voices along the way and being misled. And that's what I want to consider with you today. There are a lot of voices out there, and then there are a lot of voices in here. But I'm thinking primarily of three voices when it comes to this subject of hearing and discerning God's voice. The first is what I could refer to as the voice of Satan. Jesus himself identified Satan as a murderer whose weapon of choice is lying. He murders through lies. John 8, this is the words of Jesus. When he speaks of Satan, he says he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's sobering. The earliest picture you have of Satan in Scripture is as a liar to Eve. He does a couple of things. He makes God seem more oppressive than he truly is. He tries to convince her that God is holding out on you. He's holding things back from you. And then he goes so far as to even bald-faced lie to her. You will not certainly die if you eat of that tree. The very first human beings in a perfect world called Eden were confronted with a decision. Am I going to listen to a voice and follow that voice other than the voice of my maker. Even Jesus had to grapple with the voice of the enemy in the wilderness where he was tempted. And note, the enemy dressed up some of his suggestive temptations, even with Scripture. It's quite fitting. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 and 14 that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. But Satan just doesn't disguise himself as an angel of light. Sometimes he works through the suggestions that we make to one another as human beings. Jesus had to again grapple with the voice of the enemy, speaking through the suggestions of one of his own disciples. Do you remember that moment where he tells Peter in Matthew 16, get behind me, Satan? You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This sobers me. This tells me that it's a possibility that some things that I am concerned with are not things of God. In fact, some things I'm concerned with actually have Satan's lies wrapped up somewhere in them. What's so wild to me is immediately before this story, Peter is the first disciple to confess Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says this. This is the story before this one. Matthew 16, 17, Jesus says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So watch this. 
in, in a span of the same chapter, in back-to-back stories, Peter can hear from Satan in one story, the first story we looked at, and can hear from God in another story. Peter hears from the Father in heaven about Jesus. He has a revelation about who Jesus is. And the very next story, Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. Peter can hear both voices. And he operates out of hearing both voices. Peter has his good moments and he has his bad moments. Back to back, just like you, just like me. And our enemy's aim is to do anything he can to keep you from hearing the Lord. And so he's always chiming in with another voice. But there's another voice behind it besides his voice. There's a second major voice. I would call it the voice of self. We talk to ourselves. I think of the dad pushing his cart through a grocery store. His three-year-old son is in the cart. The little boy's crying, whining. It's the end of the afternoon. Kid's carrying on, hadn't had a nap, needs a nap. Dad frantically is trying to get the groceries. A woman overhears him, calm down, Donald. It's going to be okay just a little bit longer, and we're out of here. So she decides to try and help. She comes around the corner, and she says, I'm going to try and talk to the little boy. And she says, what a big boy you are, Donald. The dad says, oh, that's not his name. She said, oh, I thought you were just talking to him, just now trying to calm him down. He said, no, my name is Donald. I was talking to me. I was trying to calm me down. And we do talk to ourselves. And this can have its pluses and this can have its minuses, depending on what you're telling yourself. You can read in the Psalms, like Psalm 42, where the psalmist will speak to his soul and tell his soul to put its trust in God. There are places where the prophets of the Old Testament, they'll be talking to themselves and they will be quoting scriptures, like the prophet in Lamentations 3 will be quoting something else from Psalms. The Lord is my portion. And so there are times when you can talk to yourself and tell you good, tell yourself good things. But then there are passage, passages in Scripture that also illustrate the opposite. There are times where we entertain our own voice and what we keep saying to ourselves isn't so good. Genesis 17 and 17. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? He's saying this to himself after he gets the promise that he and Sarah will bring forth a child from their own bodies. He's speaking this over himself. You know, is this possible? Will a dude that's a hundred do this? Will a woman that's 90 do this? He's saying this to himself. I think of the story of Jacob and Esau. Will you read this in Genesis 27 and 41? Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. This is not a good thing he's saying to himself meditating on it. I think of the story of Esther and the arrogance of that man named Haman in Esther 6 and verse 6. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor than me? He's thinking to himself this. Of course, scripture warns us against thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. Psalm 14 and verse 1 says this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Again, you say things even in your own heart to yourself. In Luke 12, 16 through 21, Jesus tells that story about the rich man, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and I will store my surplus grain, and I'll say to myself, check this out. He's envisioning a time in his future, and he already has mapped out what he's going to say to himself. (laughs) He's talking to himself about what he's going to say to himself in the future. And then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, 
This very night your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. It's just stunning to me. All this is a story about a man and how he thinks to himself, what he envisions saying to himself. Now, it's interesting. Jesus tells that story right after telling people, watch out. A person's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. But it's amazing what you can talk yourself into and how your own voice can distract you from the Lord's voice. More than once, we're counseled in Scripture, do not be self-deceived. There are verses that speak of not allowing Satan to deceive you, but there are also verses where we're told, don't be self-deceived. There are other examples in the Gospels of what uh, uh, where, where we're told what people are thinking to themselves or saying to themselves, and Jesus speaks up and addresses what they're thinking or saying. Oh, may it be so for us. Thanks be to God for the moments where God interrupts your monologue to yourself. Thanks be to God for the moments where God addresses what you're thinking before you even act on it. And that brings us to a third voice the voice of the Savior. Jesus said in John 10 and 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This isn't to say that sheep don't hear other voices. We hear other voices, but we listen to his. This isn't to say that, that, that they, they, it's impossible for them to hear other voices. No, they hear other voices, but they follow him. I've said before, that's not to say that there isn't a need for discernment from time to time. In fact, I'm about to teach on that here in just a moment. But like I said last week, his sheep know his voice, but the truth is every sheep is first a lamb that has to discern his voice. Now, I've talked with you earlier in this series about one of the ways the voice of the Lord can be heard is internally, in your heart, in your mind, in One form of that is a thought in your head or your heart. And I want to spend a few moments with you that's strictly about discerning a thought in your head or your heart. And how do you recognize this as the voice of the Lord and discern that it's not the voice of yourself or even the voice of the enemy? Dallas Willard in his book about hearing and discerning God talks about three aspects of learning or recognizing somebody's voice, particularly when you can't always see them. Just think about human beings in your life. Think about your family members. Think about people in your life. And he says, um, you learn these three aspects through time and experience with a person. One aspect is the quality of their voice. You can learn to recognize somebody's voice by the quality of it. And he's talking about uh, tone, pace, pitch, volume. Most of you know that Tara is an identical twin. She and her twin Shannon used to be entered into competitions in the state fair in the late 70s and early 80s. You can find stories in the Dallas Morning News where she and Shannon are in the Dallas Morning News because they are being entered into competition as the twins that look the most alike when they were little. And they would be entered into these competitions. Uh, They look so much alike that in college they could sit in each other's classes, sit in for one another, and nobody would ever know it. Now, full disclosure, I think that was only done once. When I first knew them as acquaintances, I couldn't tell their voices apart, but I grew to over time because of how much time I've spent with one of them. I can tell a difference with tone, pace, and pitch. Even our sons had trouble the first years they were alive deciding which was which at holiday gatherings. Interesting. But over time, you can learn to distinguish their voices. So the quality of somebody's voice is one way you can recognize, oh, that might be fill in the blank. Here's the second thing, the spirit of their voice, Dallas Willard says. Someone's 
usual voice can be passionate or it can be flat, it can be whining, it can be demanding, timid or confident, coaxing or more clear and directive. Then he says there's a third thing, the content of their voice, what they are communicating. Have you ever been told something that someone else said and you thought, there's no way they said that. I know them. If you were to say, hey, I heard Ryan say he hates baseball and can't stand the Rangers. And I'd be like, you are full of it. I've known Ryan for 18 years. He loves baseball and he loves the Rangers. He suffers with them every year. If somebody were to run around and says, uh, my, uh, Chris loves the Philadelphia Eagles, you would know that's not true if you know me. No. The content of their voice, what is it they're communicating? Because you know someone so well, you know what they stand for, you know what they're like, what they dislike, you know their preferences, their opinions, you have an idea, you know, just by the content of their voice as to who that might be. Now think about these things as they relate to the Lord, the quality of their voice, the spirit of the voice, the content of their voice. Let's talk about the quality of God's voice. You go, what do you mean by that? Willard goes on to unpack this a little bit more. He says, he's not talking about audible sound per se. What he talks about is the authority of the thought or the impression of it. Now, Hang with me here. Remember that the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Jesus. So if you want to have an understanding of the ways of the Holy Spirit, you can study Jesus in the Gospels because he's the Spirit of Jesus. You can get an idea of the Spirit's voice within you by looking at what Jesus is like in the Gospels. Now check this out. When Jesus spoke in the Gospels, often the Gospel writers said he spoke as one with authority. What did that mean? Spoke one with authority. The rabbis in his day, when they taught, they would quote from Scripture or they quote from another influential rabbi to back them up because they had no authority in and of themselves. Uh, it, it's like an attorney citing a witness or an attorney citing a precedent. They don't have an authority in and of themselves. They have to build their case. In that same way, when I preach, I, I'm referring you to Scripture. Why? Because I have no authority in and of myself. Okay. Jesus, while he did quote some from the Old Testament, oftentimes he spoke with no other reference. He didn't quote anybody. He didn't try and get his authority from anything else. For instance, he said stuff like this. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He said stuff like this. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, I want you to think about this. Just those two statements. He just says them. But they, they, they had a sense of authority with them. A self-authenticating authority. Think about this. Have you ever considered how many public universities have famous sayings of Jesus engraved all over the place, and yet it's a sad irony. Nobody knows that it was Jesus that said that. I went to the University of Texas. Walk around the University of Texas. Look at the tops of buildings that say, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And yet when they survey students, most of them think a U.S. president said that, not Jesus. You can go to every major university in the country and find words of Jesus engraved somewhere on a building. Why would people do that? Because there's, when he said what he said, it just lands with authority on human beings. They thought, huh. Of course, the idea is, is that his words would be engraved on our lives as disciples. Amen? In fact, you ought to just consider, you, you ought to just do a study sometime of how many public buildings, markers, museums have the words of Jesus, something he said engraved somewhere on them. It is stunning. This is true with all over the world. Because what he spoke, he spoke with an inerrant authority. Now, E. Stanley Jones, 
uh, when talking about trying to discern the voice of God from your own subconscious said this. I thought this was so good. He said, perhaps the rough distinction is this. The voice of the subconscious argues with you, tries to convince you, but the inner voice of God does not argue, does not try to convince you. It just speaks. It's self-authenticating. So let me give you an example of this in real time. I was visiting a while back with a sister in our church who was telling me about a moment of real frustration with her teenage daughter. She was really angry. And after having a conversation with her teenage daughter who was completely out of line, she went into her bedroom and she said, first line of a prayer to the Lord, Lord, she's in... And I'm not going to say what she said about her daughter. But she used a word that is in some versions of the Bible. It's another word for donkey. Lord, she's in. This mother was so frustrated. And instantly, she heard in our spirit, she's not in. She's my daughter. And like that, she broke. She's like, you're right, God. I am so sorry. She repented right there, and she asked for forgiveness. It wasn't a screaming voice. It wasn't a badgering voice. It was an immediate thought, calm, clear, and direct. Now, I want to tell you this. This is so good about the Lord when he speaks. Her daughter had been completely out of line, but God would not allow her to refer to her daughter in such a way, even in prayer. And in that moment that she repented and asked forgiveness, she was also simultaneously deeply consoled that she was not in this alone, looking after her daughter and raising her daughter. She was reminded she's got a father in heaven too, and it's not all on me as a mom. Only a word from God can do this. Only a word from God can be simultaneously corrective, encouraging, and comforting all at once. That's not human beings. Human beings, we offer a corrective word, and then we have to come around and clean it up for a while. But just that simple response self-authenticating in her heart, clear, corrective, but also encouraging and consoling. The quality of his voice. I was visiting with somebody just yesterday, a young man who lives in another city. He's in the corporate world, but he's thinking about a call to ministry. And he says, just Pastor Chris, just over and over and over in my mind, I just, I have this anxiety about me that I'm gonna miss it. I'm gonna miss the call of God in my life. I'm gonna miss the call of God in my life. And that, I just took a moment to talk to him about the quality of that voice. Just the quality of that voice. That God does not speak to somebody anxiously. God is not anxious. He can be concerned, he can be passionate, but he's not nagging like that. And he's not out to make you anxious. And as you keep your eyes on Jesus, you will be able to discern the call. You just be faithful to him right now is what I told. Which leads me to a second quality, the spirit of his voice, or a second feature, the spirit of his voice, the quality of his voice, the spirit of God's voice. It's not nagging, it's not anxious, it's not hysterical. Now let me just give you some passage to consider. In the book of James, which we've been in some in this series, because it begins with this promise of God giving wisdom to those who ask him, in James 3, you get an idea of what this wisdom from God looks like. I think it could also be a clue as to the spirit of his voice. Read this, James 3, 17 and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now here's what I want you to see as you look at this. Three times he uses the word peace here. Pile on those words, considerate, merciful, submissive. These are qualities 
that are not pushy, that are not nagging, that are not hysterical. The voice of the Lord can challenge you. It can call you to face hard things. It can convict you of sin. But the spirit of the voice is not one of angst or hysterical or screaming. I think it's something Bob Mumford, a longtime missionary and Bible teacher, shared. One day he heard the voice of the Lord when he was in Columbia, South America as a young man. And all the voice said was this, I want you to go back to school. And here's how he describes the voice. It couldn't have been any clearer if my wife had spoken the words right next to me. It was spoken straight and strong, right into my spirit. It wasn't a demanding, urgent voice. If it had been, I would immediately have suspected the source to be someone or something other than the Lord. The vocal impression was warm but firm. I knew it was the Lord. And then there's that third feature, the content of his voice. The quality of his voice, the spirit of his voice, the content of his voice. This is about what is actually said. What the voice of the Lord says will be consistent with the truth about who he is, his will, his kingdom, as revealed in Scripture and in Jesus. So reading and getting to know the nature and character of God and his kingdom in Scripture Studying and getting to know Jesus has a lot to do with you being able to discern the thought that's in your head and where it's from. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul even left room for the possibility that the enemy would try and introduce another source to evaluate the voice of God by. But Paul kept Jesus at the standard. Check this out in Galatians 1 and verse 8. Paul says, but even if we are an angel from heaven... Watch what Paul's making an allowance for. He's making allowance for the possibility of rogue angels, which makes sense if you, if you know the story of the fall of a third of angels from heaven. He, he makes the possibility for the spirit world to be involved in deceiving people. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel, he's talking about the gospel of Jesus, other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Again, if what I'm hearing, if what I'm thinking contradicts the will of God as revealed in the whole counsel of scripture, and particularly in Jesus, then the voice I'm hearing most likely isn't the voice of the Lord. That's why, again, I tell you every week, our ears aren't really as open as we think we are to the voice of God if our Bibles aren't also open at some level. One of the most influential theologians over the last 2,000 years is a fellow named Augustine. But before he became a theologian, and more importantly, a Christ follower, he was a teacher of rhetoric and speech and a noted womanizer and drunkard. In his book, Confessions, he tells the story of being 33 years old the age Jesus died, 33 years old and weeping in his garden. He was despondent over his life, empty, miserable, educated, and Hampson, and yet was so just completely in a dark place. And that's when in the middle of bawling his eyes out, he heard in his head the voice of a child repeating playfully, take up and read, take up and read. The words had a tune to them. It was like a nursery rhyme. He heard this voice of a child. It, the voice was so clear, he looked around, he could find no child's. And he had this sense instantly that the voice was talking about scripture. He had his mother's version that she had given him years earlier, but that he had hardly ever read. And so he went and found it. He opened the version he had, and his eyes fell on what you would recognize in your Bible as Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Here are the words he read. Let us behave decently 
as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And in that moment, when he read those words, Augustine broke. He was pierced deeply to the heart. And he says in his book, Confessions, that he was flooded with this profound awareness simultaneously of his need for Jesus and yet also the love of Jesus and the call to follow Jesus. The rest, as they say, is history. So a couple of years later, Augustine is walking through the streets that had once known him as a drunkard and as a pickup artist. And a woman who he had known from his previous life saw him from across the street and had called out to him, Augustine, Augustine, and he heard her voice, but he would not turn around because he knew what she was up to. He just kept walking. And so she cried out again, and she said her name, Augustine, Augustine, it's Francine, it's Francine, and back came his voice without him ever turning around, but it is no longer Augustine. Because Augustine had considered himself as having died with Christ, according to Galatians 2 and 20, and considered himself to be raised a completely different human being. Now, I think about that day in the backyard when Augustine was weeping over the emptiness of his life and the dead end of his life, and he heard the voice of children singing a tune take up and read, take up and read. I'm telling you, that wasn't the voice of devil encouraging him to read scripture. And that certainly wasn't the voice of a womanizing drunkard either. The story behind the conversion of one of the most influential Christian theologians in 2,000 years began with a voice, but it really began before that. Augustine had a mother named Monica. The only person she loved more than Augustine was Jesus. Jesus was everything to Monica. From the moment he was born, she dedicated him to the Lord. When she was breastfeeding him, she would sing hymns over him. Monica was well known in her Christian community for her devotion to Jesus and for attempting to raise her son to be a disciple of Jesus, but Augustine broke her heart as a young man. He was a brilliant and gifted communicator, a good looking fella. He became that professor of rhetoric and he spent his 20s and his early 30s as a high functioning alcoholic, basically, sleeping around. He even enjoyed turning people away from any kind of faith in God by his philosophical questions and bantering. Monica fought despair over it all. And yet she hung on to a couple of moments in her life in regard to him that fueled her laboring in prayer. One of those moments was when she was 19. She had a vivid dream that she and her son Augustine were walking hand in hand together in what she thought was heaven. She awoke from that dream knowing that God was encouraging her not to give up in her prayers and in her representing Jesus to Augustine. She awoke from that dream with a newfound grasp on the promises of Scripture like 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 or 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 that God doesn't desire anyone to perish and she would remind herself over and over, God does not desire my son to perish. But as the years went by, he seemed to grow colder and he went further and further away. He became even more arrogant and hard-hearted But the second moment she had was some years later, a well-known and respected church leader came to her city to conduct some prayer meetings and to preach the gospel. And she managed to get a few minutes alone with him. And she spoke through her tears of how long she's been praying for the return of her son. She didn't know what to do and he didn't know what to tell her. He simply said this in passing before he got up and left, woman, it's impossible for the son of those tears to perish. She took encouragement from those words. She held on to them. 
in the same way that she was holding on to that dream. And she continued to do the only thing she could do in the meantime is pray. Because I'm telling you what, your children can resist a lot from you. They can't stop you from dropping prayer bombs on them. And she continued to pray. And it was some years later, when he's 33, Augustine's in the backyard weeping out of a sense of despondency. And it was then he heard the voice for himself. And a few years after Augustine began to follow Jesus, Monica said to him one day, my son, for my part, I find no further pleasure in this life. What am I still to do here? Why am I still here? I do not know, for I have no more hope on this earth. And when she said it, it wasn't a statement of resignation or depression. She said it because she had been given the desire of her heart, her son's salvation. There was nothing more she wanted. And nine days later, It said she died. And I think about the way the Lord brought encouragement to Monica along that long journey with a dream, with an encouraging word from another believer, two ways that we've talked about God speaking in this series. And then I think about the scripture she held on to and all that fuels this fire of this relentless, unrelenting prayer on behalf of her son until he heard the voice for himself. Now I'm gonna tell you what, Psalm 84 and verse seven says this, that they go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. He's talking about the people of God, that the people of God go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. That you're not just meant to be strengthened once, you go from strength to strength until you appear before God in Zion. And one of the great ways God perpetually strengthens you and me is by speaking to us along the way in a variety of ways conducive to our needs and where we are at that moment as he determines. There's a lot of talk in this world right now about finding your voice, conferences, seminars, therapy, self-help books. Find your voice and there's a place for that, but that's nothing compared to finding his voice and hearing him for yourself so you can continue to go from strength to strength. That's one reason why we are in the stretch of time on this series is I long for us as a group of people to learn how to go from strength to strength until each one of us appears before God in Zion with people coming behind us. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and be praying. Just join, just join me right now by bowing your heads. I want to take just a moment. In fact, as I think about the story of Augustine and his mother, Monica, right now, I just want to take a moment. And I want to give you a moment to pray for somebody you love dearly that may be a ways off like Augustine was. And I, I, can't, I can't manufacture a present word from God for you in your heart. That is the business of the Spirit. I can remind you of the written word that God desires no one to perish, that God desires all to come to a knowledge of the truth. He is patient. That's why he's waiting to return. He's patient because he longs for all people to have the opportunity. And so just take a moment. I want you to again go there in prayer and pray for that person you love. It could be a son or daughter. It could be a parent. It could be a spouse or an ex-spouse. It could be your best friend in the world, but take a moment and go there and pray for them that God would open their hearts and dig out their ears. Ask the Lord to move in mercy, that he would speak to them. Join your heart with God's for them. while you're at it, thank the Lord. If you're recognizing a way he's been speaking to you recently, you're considering the quality of his voice or something that's said that does line up with scripture, 
something you've been pondering, thank him for his voice. It's okay to ask him for confirmation. Lord, I pray that you would continue to dig out our ears. We just confess to you openly, there are times when we abide by other voices, we're lured away by other voices. There are times when we're attracted to other voices that tell us what our flesh wants to hear and yet you are the one who has the words of life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we just call our hearts back into alignment with that reality and we thank you for not giving up on us. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, won't you be standing? Won't you just sing with me a portion of this last song as your prayer? This alabaster jar is all I have of worth. I break it at your feet, Lord. It's less than you deserve. You're far more beautiful, more precious than the old. Some of my desires and the fullness of my joy Like you spilled your blood I spill my heart as an offering to my King Here I am, take me as an
You're the name. 